everybody. Um, my name is Kristen Brown. I'm the Marketing Events Manager with Ironside. Today we are going to be hosting a webinar on exploring data warehouse strategies and finding out which solution is right for your business. I already introduced myself, but on today's webinar we have Jeff Steer, who is an Engagement Manager in Business Analytics, and Eric Romanek, who is our Manager of Platform Services. We're going to quickly go through the agenda here, and I'm actually going to turn it over to Rich Seppi, who is an account executive at Ironside. Thank you very much, Kristen. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us on behalf of Ironside. You know, we've got a great agenda here that's going to really be able to look at different strategies that you can look at from a standpoint of the traditional data warehousing versus the emerging cloud-based type options. Uh, we're going to be able to really help you understand, you know, for some folks who uh, you know, want to understand really what the cloud is, exactly what it is from our perspective. You know, looking at what you guys were doing in a traditional way and then being able to look at how we're now moving this data into the cloud in a very secure way, uh, how cloud data warehousing is different. Um, some options for hybrid. You know, we as an organization support multiple customers are actually using a hybrid approach, uh, you know, leveraging traditional, but also, you know, uh, being able to incorporate a cloud-based element to that. And really decision points for how to decide what is best for you uh, from a standpoint of what's uh, data warehousing, whether it's cloud or traditional or hybrid. And then we're going to talk about some very compelling use cases as well, which I think you'll find very interested real-life scenarios that we've uh, been very successful with uh, in production in a cloud-based environment. So I want to do a brief introduction about who Ironside is. So we've been around for since 1999, about 15 years of success as an enterprise data management and analytics firm. Uh, we have about 100 employees, uh, some of which are the top talent from an information management, big data, and analytics space in the country. Uh, we have a, a very strong partnership with uh, the IBM organization as uh, both a reselling, consulting services, training, up to the full gamut of services. Uh, I think the most important uh, note there is the 500 plus happy clients, something that we pride ourselves on is a tremendous track record of successful delivery in both traditional as well as emerging technologies. And we have some customers who've been doing business with us for about a decade plus. Uh, the word partnership is a very strong one to us as far as its meaning. And uh, again, we look to establish long-term, mutually successful partnerships with our customers. So we're a very full service organization from a standpoint of the level of services we provide, both at a strategic as well as a technical delivery perspective. You know, one of the things we do that's, uh, you know, different as an organization of our size is we offer advisory expertise. Similar type of uh, value that you're, similar type of expertise you get from a big four type organization, but in a much more value-driven model, you know, typically being able to look at having strategic type guidance that we can provide to you in a matter of weeks rather than months or years. Um, and that advisory really transcends four different practices, individual practices, which either individually or collectively help our clients be successful. So we have a very uh, full service business intelligence practice, both with emerging and uh, traditional technologies there, as far as uh, some of the different things that are going on. That's based in the area of bimodal analytics, which is a very hot topic these days. Information management, which we're going to talk about today, uh, both ETF, traditional ETL, new cloud-based type data warehousing, master data management and governance. Um, doing things around business glossary and uh, those type of topics. Also, big data, you know, is included in that. So expertise on Hadoop and now Spark. So that's something that we have very deep experience in. Typically, as a business intelligence organization, that's our lineage over the, you know, how we started 15 years ago. You know, data information management was core to any project. Um, nowadays, obviously, that experience is pretty uh, important, both for looking at big data, you know, type initiatives, as well as your traditional data warehousing. Advanced analytics, which uh, oftentimes uh, is a driver of information management initiatives, so predictive analytics. Uh, if you go to our website, you probably may see some of the uh, LinkedIn feeds we have, some very exciting things we've done in that space. Recently, we had a uh, law enforcement organization here in New England that reduced crime 25%. Um, great application for predictive analytics, and, and we actually had that application up and running in five weeks, which is a tremendous turnaround for that kind of thing and performance management, which is our financial transformation area, uh, looking at your traditional financial processes like financial consolidations, reporting, budgeting, forecasting, being to help both from an advisor perspective with, you know, modifying those processes to, you know, help optimize new efficiencies as well as being able to incorporate technical solutions there. Uh, we have an onshore remote development area, so basically it sits here in our Lexington headquarters where we're based in Lexington, Massachusetts. 
you know, being able to uh, look at remote delivery of uh, different projects, you know. So we have obviously an on-site model as well with our consulting organization, but also that ability to leverage uh, remote services as well. I uh, have a very robust training and education area uh, around the Cognos information management and analytics space, so training on all the different products for our customers, both uh, traditional training as well as custom training specific to you with your data. Uh, and something that's probably our fastest growing area of our business is our enterprise hosting and, and managed services area. Uh, Eric Romanek actually is going to be on the call, uh, manages that. So really being able to use leverage the cloud, we actually host on-premise solutions. For example, we're going to talk a little bit about Netiza and pure data. We can actually host that in the cloud. You actually would never have to see or touch it. We can also provide our managed services across the IBM stack to be able to uh, provide essentially what would be like a remote DBA service, but you know, being able to do managed services for things like data stage or massive data management and the teas or et cetera. So some very exciting uh, services that we provide as a 100-person entity. Uh, you know, there's a reason we've been very successful with our customers because they request that we, based on the initial success we have, that we grow with them and partner with them on different things long term. And you know, we have a lot of different ways that we can help you guys. Uh, today we're going to talk obviously about uh, information management, data warehousing, both the traditional and cloud-based approach. And I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and Eric now to for the uh, rest of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rich. Um, so obviously, you guys are here because you want to know about cloud data warehousing. But we wanted to start out with giving you what, our, what we take our definition to be for the cloud. Um, so what is the cloud, really? Because it's not just a collection of water droplets, right? Defining the cloud. Uh, Cloud is basically a style of computing where scalable and elastic IT-related capabilities are provided as a service. And largely, this is to customers using Internet technologies, but you, know, you guys aren't just end users of the Internet. It's basically using any sort of networking to connect to these highly elastic and scalable capabilities. One of the things we have to come to understanding on is that cloud is not just about um, cost savings. You may find some as part of this. But it's really about flexibility. It's about not having to decide what you're going to need for the five, next five years and being able to just buy what you need, which is that cost flexibility and the business scalability. It also means that you're able to adapt to the market as it changes, which is that number three there. The market adaptability basically allows you to say, you know what, this technology isn't serving our needs, or we need additional technology to serve our needs. On top of all of that, you get mass complexity. You don't have to manage the infrastructure. You just have to manage how the application that you're designing interacts with the other components of the application or service you're providing. And you can do context-driven variability, which is allowing the user to drive their own experiences, be, being able to adapt to user needs and requirements near, in near real time while leveraging ecosystem connectivity to connect to other environments and other applications to add features or to expand the features you already have. One of our favorite um, analogies here is kind of this pizza as a service view. Uh, on the far left, you have what most of us do on a daily basis, which is that traditional on-premise. As an organization, we hold everything. We have servers, we have infrastructure, we have networking, we have power, we have data centers. And then on top of that, we have the operating system and the application stack and we're managing the end user experience and all the stuff that goes along with it. Um, the next phase over is infrastructure as a service. And this is your standard Amazon elasticity or your soft layer VM. Basically, somebody else provides the infrastructure and the operating system down. And we install and manage the application and the interactions of that stuff up top. Um, the, the next step over would be platform as a service. And platform as a service Basically, somebody provides the operating system and infrastructure and the application. We're responsible for developing what we use inside of that application. In the case of an analytics product, it could be reports or data models. Um, and so we're responsible for developing that against the content that's already provided as part of the platform. And then software as a service is everything's provided to you. You just have to basically go in and click and go. Um, Obviously, there's different models that par participate in specific parts of this. Like I know we, for one, kind of do platform as a service, but we can do that on-premise. So you, survive, you provide the bottom third and the top two, and we do the middle. So there's some flexibility here. But the thing to remember is this is kind of the 
standard spectrum when we're talking about these types of services. Go ahead, Jeff. Thank you, Eric. Um, and so when we talk about cloud data warehousing, we want to think about um, what it's going to be like when you do that. And in many ways, it's like other data warehousing. Uh, you're still going to have your data that needs to be structured into databases and tables and columns. Um, you're still going to be accessing that data with the same tools that you use now, ETL tools or ELT, um, reporting tools, dashboarding tools, and the like. And you're going to have to organize and model it into warehouses and star schemas. So from that perspective, the end users, when they're using the cloud data warehouse, they're not necessarily going to see much of a difference. They're still accessing the data, getting their insights, running their reports, running their dashboards. At the same time, cloud is not like data warehousing, uh, other types of data warehousing. Um, cloud is a lot more flexible. It has a lot, much lower cost, initial and total cost of ownership. And most importantly, it prom promotes an iterative model. Because you have that flexibility and low cost, it's very easy to spin up a POC, to try something out, um, to sort of take a look at how this thing might work, um, whether that's a new data structure, whether it's a new report, whether it's a new data source. Um, you can bring all those, things, all those things up much more quickly than if you had to bring a new instance into your data center and, and maybe get something new on your rack. Um, you can just expand your capability in the cloud and load it up there. End users don't see these differences directly, although they will see the results. If they're getting what they look for, what they ask for more quickly, they will be much happier. So in terms of deciding um, when you want to go on to the cloud and how you want to go on to the cloud, I want to take a look at sort of a few different maybe phases of cloud development. And if we sort of start by looking at um, you know, what you might call the path, although there are lots of places that are like this now, um, what we'll call the pre-cloud era. Where, and this is sort of the traditional, I have a data center, all my systems are there, I have lots of applications, they have databases, they have hardware, it's all on premise, I've built a data warehouse, I have BI tools, and all of that stuff is in one place. Um, and maybe I have some feeds that come from outside, like done in Bradstreet customer data, and that stuff comes in you know, in a flat file through FTP or email or something like that. But really, everything is on-premise. Um, and then we sort of have a slow emergence of the cloud. Um, and that's where I mean, people maybe are on the cloud and don't realize it. Uh, we've been to many places where we say, you know, okay, what is your cloud presence? We don't have one. Are you using Salesforce? Yes, we are. Well, then you're on the cloud. Um, Salesforce is a great example because it is often the first entry point for people in the cloud. Um, in addition to doing the sort of core customer relationship management that it does, it really provides a platform and people who use Salesforce extensively often end up wanting and needing more data to, to sort of support their core Salesforce purposes. And so we often end up not only pulling data from Salesforce into a data warehouse, but even taking data from the warehouse and pushing it back into Salesforce so that salespeople can have, you know, sort of more relevant data. So really, a lot of people have sort of you know, backed into this where all of a sudden they are supporting um, data in the cloud that they have to both push and pull into the cloud. Um, from there, we sort of move into where things are going, uh, which is where we've got um, lots of different applications in the cloud. So in addition to Salesforce, you've got, um, you know, um, Amazon Web Services, you've got LinkedIn, you have Watson Analytics doing behind the cloud. You have, doing, you have HR in the cloud, and so a lot of the systems on the left have moved into the cloud. And at that point, you are really almost working more in the cloud than you are anywhere else. And to a lot of places, this seems sort of far off, but there are places that are doing it this way right now. Um, there, especially if you're sort of starting up from scratch, it's easy to say, hey, rather than build this whole big system, let me just put it in the cloud and not have to worry, like Eric said, about, about a lot of those lower infrastructure levels and let someone else manage that. Once you've reached this point, you've really reached a point where your data gravity has shifted over to the cloud. And at that point, it may make sense to put your warehouse where the data is. Instead of worrying about getting all that data over the cloud into my on-premise warehouse, why not put that in the cloud as well, let that be elastic, let that be managed by someone else, that's where your data is. So understanding sort of where that inflection point is, is, is really key to, to making that decision for your business, for your company. The other important thing to remember, um, sort of 
harkening back to the pizza as a service slide, um, when you look at each of these things, whether they go onto the cloud or stay on premise is not a binary choice. You can have different parts of it in different areas. Um, you know, the BI can be in the cloud, the ETL can be in the cloud, or they can be on premise. And what choice you make for each of those components is going to vary based on the demands of your particular scenario. One of the other things that um, makes a difference is, is what technologies you use to um, either go into the cloud or sort of create cloud-like scenarios on premise or in a managed environment. So Eric's going to talk about a couple of those now. So one of those things, that, one of those um, capabilities we talk about is pure data for analytics. And in a lot of ways, pure data for analytics has some of the cloud aspects, but before it was cloud. It's really simple to use. It really seriously is like load your data and go. It's very fast and it's optimized for purpose. And really, in the case of installation, largely the, the IBM comes in, rolls in the rack, plugs it in, and does all of the configuration. And from then on, you have to do very little with it to maintain it. So it's fast deployment and it's easy to operate. Um, and it includes, it basically ties in with all of the IBM tool sets and in an accelerated way, which is really nice. Um, the way it's not like a cloud, if you were going to look at those, is the fact that you buy all of what you need up front. If you're going to do this as a appliance, you're stuck buying and anticipating ahead of time. So the, you know, so there, but there are a lot of things here that make this a good cloud type proposition. And, but then the question becomes, so I have this appliance, but I still have to manage it. I still have to provide the infrastructure. So what can you do with that? Well, originally you would have had this on premise, but what, one of the things that we've done for some of our clients is basically install this in a point of presence, kind of a colo facility that's a hub for, with connecting points for both your on-premise environment and a private cloud. And so we would call that our ISI logical cloud. And we're going to talk about a case study about that later, a little later. Um, and basically what you do is you have a secure connection between your premise and the Natiza. To, and you can use your own ETL tools or whatever to move your data up there, or we can host ETL tools for you and move your data that way. And we're going to make those connections between the cloud, version, the cloud applications via a secure back-end link straight into a private network or via VPN or MPLS circuit or frame relay, whatever you're using internally. Um, well, another option for cloud features, and this is like a fully cloud-based uh, solution, is DashDB. This is another IBM solution. And basically what this is is a fully data managed data warehouse in the cloud. It has a lot of the capabilities of the Natiza and the PDA acceleration, including several of the in-database analytics tools that are already baked in and more that are on their way. And it leverages the DB2 columnar acceleration that you see that you really like from an analytics point of view. So you get super fast responses that are complete and clear. Um, you can also integrate DashDB with Cloud for analytics from, your, from all your mobile and web apps. And what that means is you can take the unstructured data out of environments and basically structure it for data warehousing and analytics. And again, this has the ability to basically be a true load and go. You can just put your data in, and, and then it has the acceleration to overtake whether or not you structured it properly or made it pretty. Some of the integrations for DashDB um, include the fact that you can basically pull using DataStage, S3, um, DataWorks from any number of databases and basically use those tools to push the data into DashDB and then report on it from whatever your analytics platform is of choice. It basically, for all intents and purposes, DashDB looks like a DB2 connection. So if you can do an ODBC connection in your environment or a JDBC connection to, Dash, to a DB2 instance, you can connect the DashDB over the internet and it's all protected and secured. Um, if you wanted to compare the two of these, uh, obviously there's some differences, right? When you look at a PDA, it's using the TISA massively parallel processing. It, has, it starts at 16 terabytes and it goes up to multi-petabyte scale. So this is, 
you know, a PDA is really the ideal solution for very large data warehousing sets, right? When you get above 16 terabytes and you go up to petabytes, we we would probably advise you to go hardware just because it's just so much data to put in the cloud. But we can have conversations around it. The PDA you own. Even if we host it for you, you buy it and then we manage it and host it for you. Um, deployment time could be days or, or I think the quickest we've seen is a couple of weeks. Uh, and that included basically from order to delivery and installation. And again, we can deploy a PDA a cloud or on-premise. But when you get to Dash DB, it actually has many of the massively parallel processing capabilities of the Nativa, but it does it on a DB2 black, DB2 blue backend. Um, and again, right now the, the capacity goes from 20 gigabytes to 12 terabytes, but you can actually, by the end of the year, they're saying that they're going to have much larger capacities, and I've heard numbers up as high as 100 terabytes. With Dash DB, because it's a cloud, you rent it, and you only rent the capacity you're going to use down to a certain minimum limit, which I think is one terabyte right now. So you're going to pay for it on a monthly basis. You don't own it. There's no capital expenditure, but you also only pay for what you need. And it only takes minutes to set up. The deployment type for this solution is completely on the cloud. So how do I decide? So when you're thinking about where you want to put your data warehouse or where you want to move your data warehouse, you want to think about a few different things. Like we've been saying, where is my data is an important one. Um, and as the slide said, it's important to measure by weight, not by volume. Um, it's often hard to tell just by row counts, you know, what that represents in terms of actual data size. You may be sending certain data very frequently. You may have certain data that is, you know, an individual row of data is much larger than other, than other types of data. So you really want to look carefully at your architecture and sort of your data integration plan to see not only where your data is, but where it's moving. Um, you want to think about how it goes from the source system into your various staging areas and warehouses, and then out to the users. Do you have users who are on premise? Do you have multiple offices, and so you have users distributed? Are, are you looking to send information to external customers who are just out on the wide internet? Um, all of those things are factors that you should look at and make sure that you understand um, as you make this decision. Um, when we start talking about processes and policy issues, this is really about understanding the requirements of your business, right? Some of you guys, some of the people on this call are going to be work for biotech companies or pharmaceutical companies. Some of the people on this call are going to work for financial services organizations. You need to understand what the policies are and what the certifications are that you're required to meet for any data that you're putting in the cloud. But the thing to remember here is that not all of your data has the same security requirements. You can do a lot with pharmaceutical data without putting any personally identifiable information data out there. And you may be able to get around some of your policies. And the other thing to remember here is that we very often hear conversations about, will my data be secure? Well, the answer to that question is that the cloud's provider has a certain level of requirement, depending on the level of services you're buying from them. And so they're going to do their best to make sure that it's secure. They'll, they'll obtain certifications to allow you to put your data out there. Um, but in the end, you're responsible for the security of your own data. And what I would encourage you to do is, first of all, to audit those providers. Make sure that you're asking hard questions of your providers for proof, documented proof that they meet the certifications that they claim they have, and that you can actually see it. And the other thing I would encourage you to do as a cloud consumer is to basically Run your own tests. You may have to work with your provider to make sure that they're aware that you're going to run a test, but run penetration and vulnerability testing on the applications that you're using in the cloud. Make sure that your data is secure. You have as much responsibility for the security of your data as your provider does, and it's our job as consumers to keep those vendors honest. The, a couple other things to look at is, can I leverage any of these cloud benefits? You know, sometimes, um, some data loads make more sense on-premise, like we talked about with capacity. Right now, the PDA is starting at 16 terabytes. A lot of larger data warehouse, physical data warehouse environments, they basically, that's where they fit. But if you have a smaller data warehouse, like we have a couple of people that we know that are under a terabyte, and they don't plan on growing, it makes a lot more sense, especially for them, because their data is all resident in the cloud, 
for them to talk about going to the cloud and moving that data out so they don't have to manage it? Do you need the scalability? Do you not really have a, are you entering an emerging market where you don't have a full understanding of how your data is going to grow? Are you, you know, these are the questions you should be asking in order to assess whether or not it makes sense. Some of your data you may segregate and put in the cloud because you need the public accessibility and you don't have the same security requirements as other portions of data in your current system. The thing that you can do here is consider a cloud POC. They are really easy to spin up and we're going to talk about that at the end of this conversation. So one other thing that can you know, create, I guess, a wrinkle in this kind of um, decision is big data. So we just, as an example, wanted to talk about how a couple scenarios in which you might uh, incorporate big data into this kind of architecture. So um, in this example, um, you've got something where um, you have um, a big data source coming in from um, outside, say from Facebook or Twitter or one of those, or some sort of other large aggregator. So you have a high volume of data coming in, and um, you know you're trying to put that into a um, Hadoop cluster, such as Big Insights, and, and do some processing on it. So given that the data is already outside your um, data center, it might make sense to also keep the big data installation in the cloud, um, do your processing there, and then take the insights that that processing generates uh, via Hadoop or Spark, and only send those on-premise to your data warehouse. Uh, obviously, there are different decisions you could make. You could choose to have the entire warehouse in the cloud. You could have uh, your BI tool running in the cloud. In this scenario, um, we've left the data warehouse on-premise, but only brought in the piece that we need to augment the data warehouse from the external source. Um, so that was an example of sort of high volume big data. Um, another type of big data we see a lot is high velocity data, where we're getting a lot of live updates and, and users need to see and make insights off of that data in real time. Um, and so in, rather than trying to re-architect an entire data warehouse to be real time, uh, a choice that a lot of people make is to create a separate path, process the live data through a real time processing tool like Streams into a real time warehouse, um, keep that in the cloud close to the data that's coming in, and then at the same time, do batch processing to your data warehouse, keep that the way it was, keep your data warehouse sort of more batch oriented, and then both of those data sources can be looked at um, in your BI tool uh, from on-premise. And so basically you have access to both, you get the benefits of real time, but you also get this sort of first class treatment in your traditional data warehouse. Um, and this is a situation where, um, again, because of the sort of elastic demands of real time, it makes sense to have that in the cloud, um, and, but to keep the rest of the data separately on premise. So when you're sort of going through this kind of scenario and um, gathering up your, your requirements, you want to think about your um, cloud data warehousing scorecard. Um, these are things you should think about and, and, and that, make, that make it make sense for you to go into the cloud. So does it need to be fast and scalable? Do you want advanced analytics? Um, most importantly, do you want appliance-like simplicity? Um, when you go to the cloud, you're letting someone else manage a lot of the lower level stuff, the infrastructure, uh, potentially the database, potentially the software. Um, and that lets you focus on data warehousing and business outcomes. And that lets you more quickly scale up, more quickly create POCs, more quickly create you know, new phases, new iterations, new revisions. It lets you come back to your customers and say, hey, you asked me to make this change, or you asked what would happen if we did this. Here's what it looks like. And the faster you can do that, the faster they're going to be happy. So let's talk about a couple common use cases that we see for cloud data warehousing. Often we'll see cloud data warehouses used to basically extend, your, extend or migrate what your current data warehouse has or is to the cloud. Because of the, the flexible, cost-effective um, nature of cloud data warehousing, a lot of people will just start it out with a couple of different data marts, and then they'll work on moving the rest across. Hybrid cloud models do support your ability to move things from your data warehouse so that all of your new development starts in the cloud, and you're basically just waiting for the current data warehouse to, um, to become, to be remodeled into the cloud. 
You can do hybrid, and we'll talk about in our, in our case studies, a couple, one of the hybrid um, models that we've seen used in the past. Um, cloud data warehouses allow you to use advanced analytics engines. So this is specifically useful for a lot of the predictive analytic type models. And, and the great thing about these, and this is true of DashDB, but it's also true of other uh, data warehouses in the cloud, they, they allow the analytics to happen in the data warehouse, which when you're on the cloud, that makes a big difference. The more you can push back to the database without chatting back and forth with the application, the better your performance is. So being able to leverage those advancements, those accelerations in the, in the data warehouse, means that you send a request all of the processing is done at the, or a chunk of the processing is done at the data warehouse, and only the results are sent back to you instead of having four or five steps in between. When you're over an internet connection or any kind of networking connection, that's, that's very useful from a performance point of view. Um, another use case is if you're trying to build a data warehouse but you don't really have the staff or want to dedicate the staff to managing that warehouse. Uh, this is basically if you have a lean IT staff, and you basically want to have this capability without having to do significant investments internally. This gives you flexibility and agility, and it basically allows you to leverage the data that's already in the cloud quicker. So let's talk about a couple of case studies. First case study is a company that we work for. They're, they're a top U.S. fitness franchise, and they have a really small IT staff. That's not their focus. They wanted a full data and analytics cloud provision from us because they were focused on running gyms, not data centers. What we did for them is we basically did a pure data, hosted pure data in the cloud, and we manage and host their entire information management and analytics stack. And we do all of this on infrastructure provided by IBM Software, leveraging secure connections to the pure data and VPN secure connections back to their environment. It's all on a private network. There's no security openings for that for anybody to go through. They're all protected. The great thing about this for them is that it basically allowed us to deploy the PDA in two weeks, and we're able to do the enterprise data warehousing with agile deployment on an ongoing basis. They're leveraging the PDA for in-database mining. They're doing predictive analytics models against it, and it's working great. Uh, it's performing much better, and that allowed them to spend less on the PVUs for their SPSS server. And the architecture looks a lot like this. Um, in this case, everything's in the private cloud. They're pulling data from Infosphere and data stage, or from Salesforce and from their financials and their po po point of sale systems. And they're using ETL to transform them into Nativa where they can then report and do analytics off of them. Another case study, we had a pharmaceutical company. They had certain requirements as to what information they could make publicly available, but they needed sales reporting to be accessible externally to all their users. So what they did is they did a hosted subset of data from their original data warehouse, and they had a Cognos analytics environment on top of it. This took us less than a month to spin up, and the deployment took almost no interaction from the client. They were able to grow and demand, grow with demand and scale out as necessary. And their environment looked a lot like this. You know, you have the sales data, the orders, and supply chain, and they had an internal cognitive that's that's already running. And what they did is we basically used ETL to dump a, a subset of their data out to a data warehouse in a private cloud that was accessible from the internet. And this allowed their sales users to be nationally available or internationally available still have access to the data without opening up the more sensitive data that they had on the internal Cognos environment. This is a great example of one of the reasons to use a hybrid data warehousing solution. So you can get the flexibility without all of the cost or the risk. In summary, cloud isn't replacing data warehouses. Um, you're going to as we talked about at the beginning, there's a lot of reasons to keep your data warehouse internally, but there may be some reasons to start thinking about either um, adjusting and adapting or shifting completely from the data warehouse you've built inside. And, and even if you move your data to the cloud, it's really still in data warehouses. It's not like the nature of organizing, structuring, storing, and accessing your data is significantly different. Your end users might not even know you did it. 
Um, at some level, your developers will know you did it, but really, it's a lot of the same concepts being applied to a different environment. Um, and in order to make that change, as, as we've been talking about, you want to know what your data gravity is. You want to know how much is in the cloud and how much of your users, how much of your data, how much of your data movement, um, how much of your future business. Um, and so understanding that, understanding how your business uses and moves data is critical to making that choice. And knowing where that data is being used can play a large role in this. As we showed you in the, case, in the second case study, that company had less security requirements on their sales data than they did on some of the other data in their system. There may be reasons where you want to either have a separate data mart or a, sep or a subset of your data warehouse out in the cloud. Um, and there may be types of data that you want to be able to pull on reports that you don't want to bring all the way into your WAN. You know, when you're talking about big data implementations, say Internet of Things type stuff, where you have massive amounts of data coming in, you may not want to bog down your internet pipe for your company with that data. You may want to put that stuff in the cloud and be able to pull analytics off of that and the data warehouse that you have inside for your sales data. So understanding where your data is being used and what security requirements are required for each of those or for all of those use cases is very important. And most important, you need to plan for the future. You may not need a cloud data warehouse now, but there may be case studies coming down the pipe. And this is why it's so important to be thinking about and paying attention to conversations like the one we're having here. You know, you want to be aware of how to make those decisions and what goes into what kind of things to consider. And lastly, um, just remember that doing a POC in the cloud is very easy and very fast. If this is, this is an emerging technology, it's something that there's going to be more and more of in the future. And it's nice that it's really very simple to go try it out and put something up there and see how it looks and see if it's something that makes sense for you to do. Um, it's not something where you're going to be making a huge capital investment so you can get up and running and have a look at it and try it out for yourself. All right, so the first question that came in was, uh, they asked, does Ironside host the cloud on ITS infrastructure or are you hosting on another vendor server? So Ironside does not host on its own infrastructure. We leverage software for most of it. When it comes to the PDA, we actually use a co-location facility. And all of that stuff, we can verify and guarantee certain levels of security and certification, as well as who has access to what. Um, and sometimes, we actually just manage environments on-premise at, at your company. So we can help you run some of this stuff, like your PDA. If you wanted help managing that, but you already had one on-premise, we can help you with that. Great. Are there any technologies to help with large data volume moving in the cloud, compression, bigger pipes, et cetera? Well, I mean, from a hardware perspective, obviously, you can, you know, increase or decrease the size of your sort of, you know, guaranteed uh, private connections to help with that volume. Um, in terms of um, software compression, I think it's something where we've tended to see when we had high volume situations, we've tended to put the warehouse near the data so we didn't need to go to that. Um, I think if we had a scenario where that was necessary, you know, yeah, then you have to you have to look at the specific circumstance, something like, um, you know, either, either compressing on route or in batch. Right, and, and there are, you know, there are a lot of technologies out there that do allow you to compress. I've been involved with projects where we were moving 25 terabytes a week around the world. So there's a lot of data compression capabilities out there. Uh, from a database perspective, we'd, we'd want to work with you to figure out what it is you're trying to do. Um, Aspera is one of the technologies from IBM that does that. Um, but we can definitely have that conversation. But like Jeff said, it's going to be a matter of figuring out what the best fit is for your company. And we can do that. We have exposure to a lot of different technologies, and we have understanding in a lot of different ways. Um, yeah, and so that's something where you know, it also depends on the specifics of the data storage. So you know, there are particular, there are particular um, types of data that um, Dash can access very quickly, things like S3. Um, and there are, you know, compression technologies that exist out there for, for doing work in the cloud. So these are things that we can go into, that we can look into. Okay. Another question that came in was, how does Cognos work with DashDB? 
So there are a couple different ways that um, Cognos and DashDB can connect. There, there, there's actually a, um, uh, I guess, completely on the cloud um, version of Cognos that is integrated as part of Bluemix, where where you can you can work Cognos into your Bluemix applications. Um, additionally, as Eric said, um, DashDB works like a DB2 connection. So Cognos can, can connect to DB2, so you can point Cognos at DashDB just like you can at any other database. So that's sort of you know where we come back to um, Cognos, sorry, being in the cloud, not necessarily appearing any different to end users. Uh, to, to a standard Cognos user, they could come on and run a report, and you know today it's in DashDB, yesterday it was in you know, DB2 or Oracle, and they don't know the difference. They're still getting their data, they're still getting their report. How does this work if we have two warehouses and 28 other application databases? So I think, it, I mean, it works, you know, the specifics of how it works depend a lot on not just the number of, of app databases you have, but how they're currently integrated and stored. Um, if you have two warehouses, presumably they each exist for their own purpose. It might be that one or both of them make sense to remain on premise and one of them should go into the cloud. It may be that you want to take data from both of them and combine them into the cloud to serve, like in our second case study, sort of an external audience that has specific data needs. And so there's certainly no scalability issues. It doesn't, you know, the fact that you have 28 other databases doesn't pose any issue. It just does mean that you want to understand how the data is moving from those databases to your warehouse and then from there to your users. Um, there's, a, there's a number of different ways you can come up with the, with the right solution. Um, and that's the kind of thing that we'd be happy to talk to you about. Why should I care about cloud if all my data is still local? Well, I mean, that's a good question. The data gravity doesn't meet your needs there, right? The reality is maybe you don't care about cloud, but it wouldn't be a bad thing for you to understand the benefits and the capabilities there. And if you can do it for free, it's, yeah, I mean, the cost of scaling. If you continue to get more data in-house, you're going to, you know, the cost of accommodating that data in your traditional ways is going to be significantly more expensive. So as long as you're okay with that from a cost of ownership perspective, you know, cloud is a good, you know, option for being able to more cost effectively scale as the data set grows. Also allows you to do some things like, you know, no one wants to hear fail, but you can take some things, do some things on the cloud, fail fast and do something else versus the traditional technologies, you know, it's a lot longer time before you find out if something's not going to work. Right. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think, I think, um, Exactly. You, you, know, you may not be on the cloud now, but it's coming, um, and at some point you probably will be, and it will let you try things out and proof of concept things um, way faster than you can internally. And because it is elastic and separate and flexible, you can spin something up and then decide what you want to do with it, even if that something is bring it on premise. Right. Another question that came in was, did I understand you correctly that Ironside doesn't host the cloud on its infrastructure but on another vendor's services? As a client, do I only work with Ironside or with other vendors too in addition to Ironside? So the way we construct our agreements when we do hosting, we basically manage the entire relationship with the vendors. You only interact with us and we work with the vendors to make sure that we get the services that you're guaranteed. So um, you really, the buck stops with us and we can we can do the hosting, we can do the managing, and we can do the development if that's what you want us to do. All right, we don't have any other questions that have come in. Uh, if you can think of anything afterwards, we're going to be sending this presentation along with a replay out in the next couple days. Um, if we don't get it out to you tomorrow, we'll have it out to you by the middle of next week. In the meantime, if you have any questions regarding the presentation and, and can't wait until next week, <laughs> uh, you can email any questions over to myself, kbrown at ironsidegroup.com, and I can make sure that your question gets directed towards the right person. Um, we also want you to take a look and visit the special offer. There's a link right on the screen there. Jot that down, take a visit over to the landing page where we'll have all of the details around the offer, contact, contact information, and um, go from there. But we look forward to hearing from you guys, and we really appreciate you joining today's webinar. All right. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, guys.